Twitch streaming. It's all yours. So, hello, everyone. I'm Frederick. I'm Rob Dabrowski, and uh, we're from UPE, which is WPI's chapter of uh, UPE. It's a Upsilon computer science. Upsilon Pi Epsilon. Yes. Okay. So, today our presentation will be on GCC and make files, and Fred's going to start us off. Okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Everybody here? Okay. So, what we're going to go over today. Uh, we're going to go talk about what GCC is, uh, the compilation process, uh, some useful flags for GCC that you should probably know if you're going to be doing anything related to CS with GCC. Uh, then Rob is going to talk about make files and what we use make files for and how to use them. Okay. So, what is GCC? It stands for the GNU Compiler Collection. It's a compiler and a linker. Uh, it's for C. G++ is for C++. There are multiple other versions for other languages. Uh, I believe Fortran is supported, Ada is supported. Basically, if it's a programming language out there, GCC supports it in some form. There's even a version of GCC for Java. Uh, so GCC supports just about everything. Some other compilers you may be familiar with. Uh, LLVM Clang is a set, is LLVM. Clang is the actual compiler. LLVM does other stuff. Um, and Java C is another one. So if you ever use Java, Java C is what is what Java uses to compile all of your programs. So the compilation process is a very simple four-step process. So we start with preprocessing. Uh, then we move. That's when we take C and we turn it, and we do some. Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Then we move to compilation. Then we move to assembly. And then finally we move to linking, and at the end is produced a executable file uh, in what, for whatever machine you're building it on. So for Linux it produces in one form, for Windows it produces in another. Um, but at the end you have something that you can run on your target computer, hopefully. Okay, so let's start with the first step, preprocessing. What does it do? It expands the header file. So if I include printf, it expands all of the definitions inside of printf. or standard io. h. Okay, it strips out all your comments. It expands all macros, which are anything that you use with pound define. And then file extension is generally .i. Uh, you don't really ever see these files, but they do exist. And then we can look at the output of this with the dash e flag on GCC. So, move over to Putty. This is a why did you stop? I did not press stop. Oh, that got me again. Uh, okay. Um, so this is a pretty simple... Uh, can everybody see that okay? Do we need to dim the lights? Good? Okay. So this is a pretty simple Hello World uh, program. We start by including standardio.h, so we have access to the printf function. Then we do a pound define. This is the traditional pound define that you're familiar with. Uh, it defines hello world to be the text hello world new line. Then we define a macro. This macro takes two arguments. It's called average. And what it will do is it will average these two arguments. So A plus B, cast it to a float, divide by two. Pretty simple. Next we move to preprocessor uh, if defs. And, and what this allows you to do, the preprocessor language in itself is powerful. You can do different things with the preprocessor language. So here I'm saying if there is a preprocessor variable called debug, which is different than any, any variable you declare in your regular code. But if I've defined debug, much like I've defined hello world here, then debug print is going to be equal to this statement. This statement is called a variadic macro. It allows what it allows me to do is it allows me to take create a macro which takes multiple arguments. So the syntax for that is dot dot dot, and then to use all of those arguments here we say printf varg. So what you might want to use this for is, for example, in this case, what debug print is going to do is it's going to take some number of arguments. So a normal printf statement, which we know takes some number of arguments. 
and then it's going to put them inside of a printf statement, which then will work just as you've norm just as you're used to. Okay, and then again we use some preprocessor definitions to say else. If we're not in debug mode, then we don't want to do anything. So we've just defined debug print to be a variadic macro which expands to nothing, literally nothing. It doesn't. It it, it just replaces the text with blank, and then we end our preprocessor if. So, anybody have any questions on that? Cool. And then main is pretty simple. We print hello world. We print the average of one and two with our macro. Then if we can use we can use the, the if defs anywhere in the entire program. So we can do if def debug right inside the main line of code and just create different different program flow. And then finally we use the uh, we use our variadic macro. Okay. So now Okay, so what we said, we said the, the dash F flag, so, or excuse me, dash E flag. So GCC dash E dash O hello world dot I, and then we want to compile hello world dot C. Okay. So, let's take a look at that file. Hello world dot I. First, we see a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. These, what these are, is the expansion of standard io.h. There is a lot of stuff in standard io.h, as we can see here, and it's all expanded and it's put into this file, into this .i file. And here we can see some standard io stuff, some more standard io stuff, some more standard io stuff, still more. Still more. Uh, ah, here's some of the file I/O stuff. So if you're if you're doing stuff with file operations, f open, f close, f flush. Uh, here's printf. That, that's the definition of printf. So it expands that and puts that in this file. Some scan scanf is right here. Okay, let's skip to the end. Okay, and then here is our actual code. So 95% of this is stuff that we haven't written. So if we take a look, I don't know how well this will actually work because it's a small screen. So we can see what the preprocessor does with these macros is it literally does a text replace. So here, where I had hello world, it's now put that in there, right? So it's just straight up string replace, done. Next, average of one and two is, uh, let's scroll over, again, just a straight string replace, except instead of A and B, we now have one and two. And then we're not in debugging mode, so everything else vanishes. And finally, there's just a uh, just a semicolon there because there's a semicolon on the end of here which is not part of the macro. Okay, so we have a we have just a stray semicolon there which is which is perfectly fine. So that's the preprocessor. At this point, this file is now ready to be compiled and turned into actual assembly language, things that we can actually do with it. So. Again, the preprocessor expands all your headers. So if we, if we include our own header, all the definitions, all the type defs would be in there. It strips out all your comments, expands the macros, and it's, the output is a .i file. Next is compilation. This takes that file that we just looked at and translates it into assembly language, into literal assembly code. And the type of assembly code is dependent on the machine that you're using. So any of your modern computers today, your desktop computers, will be using x86 or x86 underscore 64. Um, generally referred to as either 32 or 64-bit. Uh, the file extension is generally .s. 
and then we can look at this with output with the dot s flag. So if I go back to my shell, This is assembly language. If you've taken, um, I think it's 2011, with Professor Lauer, you'll be familiar with x86 assembly. Um, if not, this is the language that your computer runs. This is transforming C into something your computer can almost understand. It's still human readable at this point. That's the next step. We'll turn it into something that we can't even understand. But here, we can see this is our, this is our function. So we have main here, and then all of these assembly language instructions are our actual program. So it takes our program, and then it actually turns it into things. And we can see here, it's doing a print here. It's calling printf. Uh, it hasn't done any linking yet, so it doesn't know the offset of printf. It doesn't know where in printf memory is. Uh, here we're doing a printf as well and all sorts of fun things like that. So, another thing, what about all of our debug stuff, right? We have, we have deb if we look back at hello world.c, we have this line of debug statement here, and then we have this whole debug print, and we haven't used either of those yet because debug is not defined, correct? So. We can define things in GCC with the dash D flag. So if, like that. So I've now defined debug. First, let's take a look at the, uh, at the preprocessor output. I'm going to call it hello world debug dot I. OK. All this stuff is the same. The only difference is come here. This time, instead of well, I'm not in debugging mode, we see I've enabled debugging mode. And here, it's replaced my debug print with my variadic macro. Pretty straightforward. OK. The next step of, this, of the compilation process is assembly. So we've moved through preprocessor. We've just compiled to assembly language. Now we have to take the assembly language and turn it into something the machine can understand. Currently, it's readable to us. It's filled with, th this file is filled with characters that are ASCII, that we can understand, that make sense to us. They don't make any sense to the computer. And it's, pretty, it's a pretty big file. Computers don't need as long words as us in order to understand the same thing. So, it takes human readable assembly code and turns it into what's called byte code, which is essentially a whole bunch of, uh, they're, they're essentially a bunch of numbers. Um, it looks like a bunch of gibberish when you look at it, and I'll show you in a second. Um, but it's in hex. If you, you can open up any executable in a hex editor, and you can see memory addresses, and you can see the, the values in each section of the program. And often, you, what you can do is you can scroll down to some of the sections. Some of the sections are still in ASCII. So we have a string section in binary files. And those are still in ASCII, because those still need to be displayed to us. Because printing a whole bunch of escaped characters isn't going to help you when you're trying to print something. Okay. So these are non-human readable. There are quote unquote holes in each of these files. So we haven't done the process of linking yet. So we haven't gone out and filled in the definition for printf. Printf is still just a call into nothingness. It doesn't exist yet. The processor has no idea about it. These are called object files. Well, the, the assembled files are called object files. And we can see them with the dash C flag. And these are the these are the targets when later when he's talking about make, this is what you what you get out when you use the dash C flag in your targets. 
So I already have a pre-compiled version. Uh, oh, that is a assembled file. Basically, this is just a whole bunch of assembly code. Uh, it looks like gibberish, with the exception of here we can see my hello world text, here we can see my average, here here this is the string formatter for printf, so we see the percent %f here, and here we see my not in debugging mode text, and then this, what GCC will do is it will also append the version of GCC that we're using, uh, which in this case is version 4.4.7. Uh, that's the compile date, 2012-0313, and it was, it's the Red Hat version, so it's 4.4.7-4 Red Hat Linux, compiled by Red Hat. And then here we see some other fun assembly stuff. And then these are function, function calls, so here's the name of the file it was compiled from. And then here's the name of our functions. So we have printf, which uses puts, and then we have main. Okay. Uh, so we've gone from this to that, which makes no sense. We can't run this yet. Printf doesn't exist. It doesn't know how to use it. This is a hole, so to speak. So the final step of this process is called linking. Linking takes all of your disseparate .o files. So in this case, it's going to go find, it's going to go use a library that's pre-installed on the system to find the definition for printf, and that's installed on just about every Linux system. It's called standard library, um, G, the the G the GNU standard library. Um, so it takes all of these separate .o files and it links them together into one file. So all of your definitions are there, all of your code is there, and the, hopefully, provided you, you compile correctly, your program will actually run. Uh, the produced file is called an executable, or, or a binary, and it's no separate flag. This, the, this is the final output, just GCC, name of the file, dash O, name of the output. And so we can accept files from any step on the process. So I can feed it a .i file, I can feed it a .s file, or I can feed it a .o file as long as it's in a format from GCC at some part of the process. So it can be straight C or anything along the line. So, world, hello world dot C. And if I run hello world, it says hello world and then Here's the output of our macro. And then that's the statement we defined if we're not in debug mode. So we can also dash o hello world debug. And here's the output of our variadic macro. There's our debugging if def. Yeah. and there's the rest of our program output. So, that is what GCC does at a very high level. Well, not very high, but high level. Is there any questions before we move on to common GCC flags? You guys are really quiet. Like, really, really quiet. Okay. GCC has many, 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 many flags. Many. If we go take a look, don't jump around on me. Seriously? Just cooperate, please. Now you tell me just to go to it. Thank you. Okay. Here are just some of the options that GCC has. Notice the scroll bar, notice the size of the scroll bar on the size. 
you're not going to need to work with 99.95% of these options, thankfully. But there are a lot of them, so here are the, some of the common ones that you should know about. Okay. Most options will read as type option. So, for an example, dash wall stands for dash, that's the, I'm invoking a flag, warnings, W is warnings, all, all warnings. So, dash wall is all warnings. Make sense? So, there are some specific types of language, uh, of flags. You have general language options. You have warnings options, optimization options, machine dependent options. So if you're compiling for x86 versus ARM, like your phone, versus MSP430, if you if you've done um, uh, embedded, these are these are options that are specific to each of these different platforms. Uh, we have debugging options. We have compilation steps options, and these are the these are the ones I just went over. And then there are also other because there are so many options that can't all fit possibly fit under these types. So, language options, most of them have either the dash F or the dash W prefix. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some of them have no prefix. Some of the most common ones that you would use have no prefix. Uh, so, for example, S dash STD is equal to standard name. So that sets the language level. So C has had multiple revisions over the years. There's standard 89, standard 90, C99. So if you wanted to use any particular language, you would do dash STD equals C99, for example. C99 gives you, allowing you to declare ints, the, the in, inside of a for loop, you can declare that variable as part of that for statement, whereas previous to that, you had to declare it outside of the for statement. Uh, dash ANSI forces compatibility with ISO C90, which is the official I ISO, um, some, some people need it. Uh, you're not likely to ever need it unless you're working in a unless you're working in an environment that requires very specific, very specific standards of uh, culpability. Okay. Warning options. Most of them have the dash W prefix. A few have dash F, and again, a few have no prefix. Uh, so some common warning options that you've seen: dash wall. Um, if you're if you're in if you took systems with Professor Lauer. He forces you to you have dash wall and dash w error, which says turn on all warnings. That's dash wall and dash w error is treat all warnings as errors, meaning they will fail compilation. So if you get a if you get a warning for un, um, unchecked cast, it will fail because you have dash w error. And then dash w pedantic uh, is used in combination with dash ansi to force strict comp compliance with ISO C. Um, most other warning options you're not going to turn on explicitly. The w dash w all will turn on most of the rest of the warning options on itself because it's dash w all. Um, there are a few that turn off warnings for specific things. Uh, generally, you don't want to use those because if it's a warning, it, there's likely a warning for a reason. Um, but they do exist. Optimization options. GCC is capable of taking your code and optimizing the heck out of it. It is going to produce the most optimized version of your code that it possibly can. Generally speaking, you don't have to worry about writing your code too heavily optimized. You do have to think about it, but a, a lot of the specific ordering of things you often don't have to think about because GCC will take a look at it and will say, this is equivalent to that, that is faster, I'm choosing that. GCC will be able to get just about everything, regardless of whether or not you pick it up on your own. Um, most have the dash F prefix, but the important ones have the dash O prefix. So, o, dash O, dash O1, dash O2, dash O3, dash O fast, dash OG, and dash OS. These are the various optimization levels. Uh, o1, o, is basically minimum optimizations. Um, O1 is basically the same thing. Uh, they're, they're equivalent. Dash O2 is slightly more optimizations. Dash O3 turns on most optimizations that are guaranteed, well, not guaranteed, but most likely will not cause your code to have issues. Dash O fast turns on a whole bunch of fun options that could make your code go, past, go fast depending on the computer that you're on 
or it could make your code break, depending on the computer that you're on. One of my favorite ones that it turns on is dash F unsafe math. So depending on the specific architecture of your processor, it can actually vary between different Intel processors. It might make it faster or it might break your math, one of the two. Um, it's fun. Um, dash OG is treat everything, no optimizations at all, as close to original as you could possibly make it. Um, and then, you know, the, the rest is just even more optimization levels. Um, so these, these manage most of the rest of the optimization flags. You're not, again, you're not generally, just like dash warning all, you're not really going to need to use any specific optimizations flags. Um, with the exception of some of the safety ones. So for example, dash F stack protector and dash F stack protector all, dash F stack protector strong. These are stack protectors which help prevent your code from being from causing a buffer overflow and allowing a malicious hacker to get access to anybody else's computer. Um, generally, you want to turn these on because you don't want your code to be the reason that somebody else's computer gets hacked. Um, that's bad. That's very bad. Um, so it, it helps to prevent buffer overflow attacks, and these are not controlled by the other dash O options. So generally, you, you want to turn these on uh, if you have any any if you're taking an input from the user at all. So some machine dependent options. You're going to work with these if you ever end up doing cross compilation for another computer. Uh, say you're writing, uh, say you know just taking any of the ECE courses. 2049, for example, um, that's your compiling code for another processor, an MSP430. So you might have to work with some of these. I'm using some of them in my work on uh, first robots. Uh, we use a PowerPC architecture, and we're moving to an ARM architecture. So we use these. So dash MABI, it selects the application binary interface, which is the ABI, or how the binary file is formatted. Every different uh, version of the process, every different pro uh, microprocessor architecture, there we go, has a different version of how files are formatted. So uh, the string section, for example, is in one place in x86 binaries and it's in a totally different place for ARM. So this specifies that file format. Uh, dash M big or little endian, uh, that specifies the, the endianness of the processor. This is whether bytes are stored low to high or high to low in memory. Um, so mArch specifies the target architecture. So if I'm compiling for ARM version 5e, it would be dash mArch equals ARM version ARM ARMv5 underscore e, I think. I know that off the top of my head, that's a little scary. Um, and then, you know, you can use x86-64 for traditional computers. You don't have to specify this if you're compiling for the length for the computer which you're compiling on. So just a tradition, traditionally this just defaults to whatever you're compiling on. So if I compile on this computer, it's going to work with x86 and x64. If I compile, if I manage to make a compiler that ran on the MSP430, uh, then it would compile for the MSP430. You're not going to make one that works on the MSP430, but good luck. So, some other options that we've seen. I'm not going to go through all the different options because we'd be here forever. Um, so we've already seen these options, dash E, dash S, dash C, dash D, and dash O. You know, these are the preprocessor, compiler, assembler. Uh, of these, you're probably going to work with dash D, dash C, and dash O the most. Um, debugging options, dash G turns on symbols. So basically, when GC, if you noticed when we were looking at the object file, GCC doesn't leave anything of your code in there. So when you're debugging, there's no way of knowing where you actually are in your code compared to where you are in the binary. So dash G will turn on leaving information in the binary so that you can actually link them. So that when you use GDB, instead of, instead of getting a trace of, oh, you're in some function and this is, this is the assembly code line you're, you're doing, you can actually tell what line of code you're on, what is null, what the variable names are, and this gives you, if you work with GDB or you work with Eclipse or any of the other debuggers, this is what gives you that ability to see things. Dash version, dash dash version, prints out the version number and exits. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Dash dash help, prints out help, um, and generally tells you to go read the man pages. Uh, yeah. So, 
I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Well, any questions about GCC compiling? Any curiosities before we move on? Oh, all right. Cool. How does, uh, how does one simply put a microphone on? Not simply. Simply. All right. So what is make? Make is a, uh, it's a Unix Lino Linux terminal command. It's, uh, it's on basically all the terminals that you'll ever use. Um, not oh, that's awkward. <laughs> this microphone is not simple. Okay, so uh, we, what happens when you call make is um, it calls the uh, the terminal command make, and then it the terminal will search for a file in the current directory. And that file will be uh, one of these three names: will be GNU make file, make file, or make file. Um, it actually makes a difference if you spell them differently. So um, make will search for that file and then execute. Uh, commands from that file, and I'll explain how that works in the next slide. But um, more on a higher level, make is a utility for building programs. Um, the most common use of a make file is putting your GCC build commands in. You know, with all the all the different compiler flags and all those flags that most people never remember, but Fred remembers. I don't remember them, so I write make files. So um, there's other advantages to make files. You can uh, label program dependencies. So um, basically, so that you make your .o files before you make your executable files, if you do those things as um, as individual steps. There's also uh, makes also really powerful because if it's made a .o file before, there will be a timestamp on that .o file, and if that file is up to date with the original C file it was compiled from. Make will actually be smart enough to not go through the compile again, and it'll just skip over it and say, "Hey, it's done," and um, do a lot of really intelligent things for you. And um, it's also, like in a really abstract way, it's a way of writing scripts for uh, terminal commands. So now moving on, how do you use a make file? So, hmm? so these are. Each of these is just a command you can call in your uh, Linux terminal. So uh, if you went to PuTTY, you could call make from any directory, and you know the terminal will try to find your make file. If the make file's there, it'll open it. Um, make all will run all of the programs that are in the all list, which I'll go over how you set that. But um, if you don't actually define what all is in your make file, these two first commands are the same. So for general use, you'll name your commands like program1 and clean. So program1 would make program1, you know, call all the GCC commands to make it. And then clean would, uh, it's what I use to clean directory, basically clean out object files or clean out temporary files. So how to make a make file. It's really simple. Um, this, this actually makes it look more complicated than it is. It's really just targets, which are like these command names, like program and clean. Oh. So targets, uh, components, and commands. So components are either files that make will uh, check for um, changes. Like it'll check your .c files if you specify them. It'll check them before it tries to compile things. And if those .c files haven't been changed, make won't do anything. Um, you can also use this to call other make commands, which I'll go over shortly. And then um, the rest of it is just a series of commands, which are literally just Linux terminal commands. You can put GCC to compile. You can change directory. You can even um, you can just you can send emails like automated emails like that, just anything you can do with a terminal, you can put in these list of commands underneath your target. So, any questions so far? All right. Oh, hold on. Well, there's a question. All right. You can use uh, the make file essentially as a bash script? Yes. Make. Yes. Um, you would, yeah, you literally just put your commands, whatever you want in the script or bash. And then um, you know, name it appropriately and just call it, and it'll just do it. So this is like a really easy way of writing scripts or bash files. So 
Now I'm going to talk about dependencies a little. And um, this is actually a legitimate make file. It's just formatted weird. So um, at the top we have the all, which means um, if you don't specify a target, this is what gets called. So if you don't specify a target, program one will get called. And um, so what program, what the target program one is, is it checks to see these two object files. And if they haven't been made, it'll actually go to these targets since the target name target name matches what's uh, being checked. And then it'll try and run this before it even starts this compilation here. So what actually happens when you call make program one is it checks these and says, oh, need to make .o files. So it goes down here, and then it calls the GCC commands that we went over earlier. And it just does the first compile step, blah, blah, blah. All that finishes, if it's all successful, it goes back up here, finishes that. And that's how, that's how dependencies work. Now, since this last command down here, hello, is not in the all, it won't get called. So you'd have to call make hello for it to happen, and then it'll echo hello on your terminal. Now, um, just a, a note, use a little pound symbol to make comments in your make files. So always comment your code, even comment your make files, even though it's not really code. That way, if you go back to this later, you can be like, oh, what is this GCC command? Oh, it links things. OK. So that kind of stuff. So there are some special commands that you can put um, before any line of a command in a make file. Like, uh, oh, I'll answer a question real quick. Sure. For which one? So, so there. Oh yeah, the output that should be a dot o. That's not dot c. That's that's a typo. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, we'll fix that before we send this out to you guys. All right, so uh, some special commands you can do. You can put a dash before any command or an add or a plus. And the first one ignores errors while executing. So, you know, if you want to suppress error messages, um, at makes it not print a standard output, and um, that can have a special effect with like at echo hello. If you put the at in front, it'll only print the hello once. But if you take out the at, it'll it'll show the terminal actually typing out echo hello, and then the output in the next line. So the at will suppress the uh, the first printing of it. And then um, plus will make things execute even if make is in a do not execute mode, which is just really special stuff. Um, also really good in make files, you can write macros inside of them. It's basically uh, just like pound defines from earlier. Uh, it works kind of similar. You just uh, write whatever your name is and then equals whatever. Uh, I have this first one here just used as a variable, so macro 1 equals 12. So whenever I want to use macro 1, I just expect a 12 to be put in, and it'll be uh, textually substituted in. So uh, here's another example is uh, compile gcc star.c, which is going to look for all C files in the current directory and compile them into executables. So that's what that macro expands to. And then down here, I made a target called GCC. It's probably not a good name for it. But um, right here is how you actually use the macro. It uh, uses the notation money sign, open paren, and then you have your macro name. And then you close the paren. And then uh, when you actually call it, it'll substitute in the values for the macro. So uh, any other questions before I move on? I'm going to start getting fancy. So uh, one special thing about every line in your make command is it's actually technically run in a different terminal instance. So it's basically like opening up another putty session for every line. And um, that can have some different, different effects. So in this first example, I have change directory to a directory. So it'll change the current directory of that instance of that terminal. But then on the next line, 
It's in a new instance. So it's like we never actually changed the directory. And um, if you're writing longer make files, this can get to be a bit of a problem. Like, say, if you write a make file to compile these programs, navigate to this directory, find a file, move the file, and that kind of stuff, then you want to have the same instance for you know, each command in the make file. So what you can do down here is you put the little semicolon and slash, and that indicates to the, to the make command to say, hey, maintain the instance. Um, I, wanna, I want ls in the directory that I just changed to. So that can make for you know, really useful and longer uh, make commands. So um, now, like the end result of writing your make files is you can do things like automated testing, which I don't know what classes you guys have done so far, but in, in the higher level classes, testing your programs is basically equivalent to getting an A. Like you have to test your programs if you're going to pass. And um, so this this is a really easy way to make it easy for yourself to test. So this first line. I have a really, really basic compile command, so it compiles it. And then uh, I have test one, two, and three. So test each of them depend on program one, you know, being done. So basically, it makes sure that program one is compiled first before it can actually run the test. So actually, running the test in this example program takes three inputs. So um, from standard in. So you can actually do that inside of the make file as well. So you, you know, dot slash program one, and then the three inputs. Just like if you're in the terminal, you can do it in the make file. So um, with this, you can make it really easy for yourself to test. So you can be like, make test three, and it runs the test for you. You don't have to, you don't have to do the build. You don't have to do the manual inputs for running the program twice. It'll just do it all for you, and you'll see the output. And um, when you have longer tests, like say you run the program 10 times in a row. This will save you a lot of time, a lot of typing. Um, so, Just some random stuff. These are, well, the first one is a, a useful thing that I like to put in my make files, and some professors ask you to do that when you submit code in a, with a make file. Uh, first one is rm-rf, blah, blah, blah. Star.txt and then the little squiggle. So the little squiggle indicates that it's a temporary file and dash rf will recursively remove everything that matches this, whether it exists or not. So it kind of suppresses warnings and then just does things for you. So I remove all temporary text files and all temporary .c files. Um, also, the standard clean that professors want is remove the .object files. You also you can add the names of your compiled programs, your executables. So it'll do it as it'll clean out everything so that next time you run make all, for example, it'll re, uh, recompile your whole program fresh and just restart it just in case you thought something weird was happening with the compile process. So you can call make clean to delete things for you. And then uh, that's, that's a random one. It's just random commands like date, sl. Uh, make, and this is an example of... Uh, actually changing directories and, and uh, maintaining the instance. So it'll make a new directory in the current directory, change into it, and then change back to the original. So just random stuff. And uh, so do we have any questions? All right, question. Uh, what's a good way to manage a make file when you have to compile tons and tons of files? Hmm. Comments. And if you're asking about um, like how to style the make file or like how to organize it, I don't have a good answer for that. But I can recommend comments and intuitive naming. Yeah. So I mean, the general the for smaller programs at least that you might be working on in um, uh, any any C course at WPI, for example, um, uh, one of the things that you, the common practice is how you have a, a target for every single one of your .c files, which produces a .o file. Um, and then you have a common target that takes all those .o files and turns them into, or an all target, that takes all those .o files and turns them into a program. And that 
can be decently usable if you comment it well for most small programs. If you want to see how really, really, really large programs manage it, clone the source of the Linux kernel and take a look at their make files. <laughs> They're insane. Um, their make files are huge. Um, so, does that answer your question? Or... Um. There's also a lot of really good resources online for uh, stuff like this. Make, Make is a really well-documented and very powerful tool that can do a lot of things for you. And I'm just going to try and find my short demo. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, um, I believe there's also is there also ways of reading your current directory. I don't know my Linux commands very well, but um, I'm sure there's a way of reading the current directory and seeing what files are there. Yeah. So, um, so another thing you can do, say for example, we have uh, debug. So re remember, think back to the debugs from my presentation, where I had to where I had to specify dash d debug in GCC. We, what we can do is we can have a make with a target of debug. And what that will do is it will actually, we have, we have a, um, a, a variable for the compiler, CC, we call it, okay? Um, and so we set it equal to GCC, and then we use it everywhere we're compiling, we use, GC, we use CC. But in my debug target, you can actually have multiple targets with the same name on multiple lines, and that will call them one after the other. Um, so we can have the first line where what it does is it just plus equals the CC with dash D debug. And then it calls all. So everywhere else, everywhere else, it's now replaced GCC with GCC dash G dash G debug, dash D debug. So now it's turned on all of that debug stuff easily. And we don't have to go and change anything in the code. We don't have to change anything anywhere else. It's just simple make debug. All right, and uh, I just got some more demo stuff. So this is a make file I already wrote. Uh, it has a command in it, make help. And all it does is it basically prints the file so you can see it. Um, you see my first command is all. And it does uh, some hello stuff. And uh, something I didn't mention before, um, there are actually more variables than are in your make file, there are environment variables that are local to your system. So, for example, log name will be my log name because I'm logged into this session. And um, you can read those in the make file. Basically the same as how you can read them from a terminal command. So um, I also have an example of variable where I just put it in quotes. And then later it'll get uh, printed, I believe. Or not. Maybe I didn't use Oh yeah, here it is. So it prints it there. Um, there's just all kinds of useful things. You guys want to see anything specific or any more questions? Yeah. Um, what do you mean when you say compile a header file? You don't compile them. No, never. They just have definitions in them. They went, all they have is definitions in them. So they're literally just expansions. When you remember earlier, there was a whole bunch of stuff on top of that preprocessed file. It literally took the contents of printf.h and put them there. That's literally what it did. It is just a way of putting things so you don't have to type everything that's in, a, in the .h file in all of your different files. What you could do if you wanted to, I wouldn't recommend it at all, but you could, is you could copy that header file, put them in all of your different other source files, usually. Uh, GCC might get angry because of multiple definitions of things. But um, if you did the proper defined guards, you could. And then it would be the same thing to the preprocessor. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. All it does is it takes the header files and it puts them 
in your .i files. It's all together. Yeah. Yeah, the end result is that. Yep. And what if you want to do the multiple Just, aha. Very good question. Uh, I will show you in a second. Let me switch it over. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it on here. PC? Um, uh, yeah, because that one's not recording. Uh, okay, this is mine. Come on. There we go. Okay. Now that the now that the assignment is due, I can actually show this without giving away secrets. Okay. So this was this was my implementation of your program three, but this is this is the define guard. Okay. So here we have if def process.h. So if process.h has not already been defined somewhere else, then define process h, include all of this junk, all of this stuff and then end the if, right? So anywhere else that includes process.h will come to this if in def, if not defined process.h, and we'll say false. Process.h is already defined. And that's it. We're done. So that's how, that's how you define things in multiple places, or uh, include header files in multiple places. Define guards. Use them. Use them all the time. <laughs> Don't write a header file without them, even if you're only including in one place. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yes, it is. And you can test this yourself. You just make a, a header file with uh, you know, with the define guard and some stupid macro in the middle, or a function definition. And if you try to include it into a C file twice, and it has the define guards, it'll compile properly. But um, I believe you get an error. It'll get an error for having multiple definitions if you don't have that define guard. Yep. And it's just a really trivial thing to show. Any more questions? Curiosities? Yeah. So, um, when you make something, you can output it to a specific file name if you want? Are you talking about compiling? Right. Or compiling. Yeah. So, if I do the dash o uh, yep. hello.txt, it'll output the executable program to hello.txt. Yes. It, uh, it won't ever, in Linux and Unix, it won't put a file extension on it. It will obey the, um, the dash O flag. But like on a, on a Unix, if you don't put the dash O to rename it, it'll output a file called a.out, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, it's a.out is what's usually done if you don't put the dash O flag. So otherwise, it'll just, it throws caution to the wind. It assumes you know what you're doing when you put that dash O, and uh, it'll do it. And that's the thing about Linux and Unix, you can you can just call executable files like new dot slash file name. And if it's compiled to be an executable, it'll run, but it will have nothing to do with the file extension. Most of the time. So Okay, so uh oh yep, question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it you. It won't do it automatically. Okay. But next time you call make and targets that um, depend on that H file, if, there, if targets that depend on the H file are called, then it'll be like, oh, okay, so the H file changed. I have to do this. So you're supposed to include that in the dependencies? Yes, you can include it in the dependencies. Yeah. 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 And it slides into the game. It slides into the game. It's not slide itself. Mm hmm. Yep. So I, I have I made a quick example of the uh, debug I was talking about earlier. Uh, so if we look at this make file, we see we have a target named all, and I have a variable called cc, which is which just replaces with gcc, and it just compiles hello world c to hello world. So if I go to my shell and I run make. Okay, here we see that it just 
That's exactly what we expected it to. GCC dash C dash oh hello world. But if we look at debug, we can see here my first statement is debug cc plus equals dash g dash d debug. And that says make this modification to this variable. It doesn't depend on any targets and it doesn't have any commands run after it. And that's it. Next, it then calls the all target. So it says run this target. So if we make this with debug, we call the debug target, we can see that it added dash g dash d debug into that command. Yes? Mm -hmm. And in Unix and Linux, the extension may not matter, but on Mac, I just did a dot, dot x, and we're just trying to open it. Well, okay, so yeah. so you can you can do that with any any operating system. Will know that um, like docx is supposed to open things, but if I go to a terminal and I do dots like like so, for example, if I do gcc dash o hello world dot this is a very long extension. <laughs> Linux doesn't care. Hello world dot C. Okay. Um. I now have hello world, but this is a very long extension. Yeah. Um, Mac and Windows will try and do things for you. That's like it's the nature of uh, oh. the operating system. Yeah, that's why, yeah. like, on a Windows computer, you'll see, like, choose this default program all the time. Like, or anytime you log on to a school computer and you change from Internet Explorer, it's like, choose Mozilla as the default. That's because it's actually trying to decide um, what program it should run when it sees a .htm, .html, .html5, whatever. That's because it's trying to decide what program it should use when it sees this extension. Yeah. So. That being said, you can open anything in any other program provided that you use the open with dialog. So, say on Windows, for example, I named something program.docs, and then I went into, and it's an actual program, right? I can still go into a terminal, a, a command prompt, and run it as just dot slash program.docs, and it will run, provided that it's a runnable thing. Yep. That'll have to do with the internal formatting of the file. Things, things beyond the extension. Yeah. It will faithfully try to run a doc a document file. It will not work, but it will try. Right. Other questions? Chris, you look like you have a question. <laughs> All right. Well, that took exactly one hour. I All right, that so good. just a quick question. How many of you are from uh, CS 2303? Right? Is that the. Yep, 2303. So, just about all of you. All right. Just curious. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we. Uh,